Um, my name is Rajni Pereira. I am an artist who lives in Toronto and grew up in Scarborough and I come from Sri Lanka. My own work responds to feelings of living in diaspora. Normally, since I've come out of school, it, we, I use science fiction as the, as the basis or the launch or the lens through which to talk about those feelings. But more recently, that has expanded quite a bit. Um, my materiality has expanded, but also the lens has expanded quite a bit as well. And uh, now I'm now I'm using a visual language that is becoming really, really abstracted and referring to, uh, you know, the aesthetic of tantric painting and energetic response or energetic analysis or, uh, I guess, appreciation and observation, as well as as well as sort of like drawing upon references from the underbelly of Sri Lanka's spiritual folkloric life. So, so while I stay in the realm of the sort of uh, the, the fantastic or the, or the, um, I guess kind of unseen. Um, I am. I. I find very many different ways to talk about that in the work that I physically and tangibly make. I'm really sensitive to power imbalances. I've dealt with them. I'm a marginalized person inside the art world, so I've dealt with them nonstop, top to toe, my entire career. And, you know, especially kind of the ideas of agency and representation, I guess would be the really, really particular things that I play with inside the idea of power, of the way that you're describing it. And uh, my intention has always been to subvert. In a way, my work is therapeutic in dealing with power imbalances my whole life, as it is for a lot of artists who are dealing with this. And we find our ways to navigate and negotiate this, this very particular way and time of working inside cultural production. We find our ways to navigate. We all have our different ways of navigating it. But you know, I mean, if, whether we're talking about Traveler series, which completely flips the idea of the protagonist within science fiction, or, you know, now uh, looking at, looking at the, the way that, you know, I can take up and navigate a spirit world that I'm not supposed to belong to or supposed to associate myself with by way of distance and having agency on that and belonging. Um, you know, I, that's the way that I, I try to navigate and negotiate these very particular aspects of, of the idea of power in general. The works in power uh, come from the series Vessel with Two Mouths. The term vessel with two mouths uh, was coined by my friend Negara Kudumu, who is an incredible scholar and uh, you know, pract spiritual practitioner in her own right. And um, I had a reading with her and this phrase popped up. And you know, I did that reading with her to prepare for a journey back home with my daughter that was investigative and also sort of um, you know, I wanted it to be productive in some way for myself and my daughter 
not as far as the creation of things, but as far as getting a feeling for where I come from, from birth and having lived experience there. That is becoming more extensive the more I'm called to go back home and the more I go back home myself. And also for my daughter, who's half of her bloodline comes from this, this particular region of Sri Lanka. So I did the reading with Negara, and then she says this phrase, you have to be a vessel, you're looking to be a vessel with two mouths. So you're hearing, you have one, one side of the vessel is towards the spirit world or the world of the unseen and then the other one you're firmly trying to touch you know throughout your journey the actual tangible world so so that was kind of like a springboard for the work in in the exhibition where i'm investigating these kind of feelings going back home and uh and and researching in my own way my experience and the lost experience and the research experience of um of yakutovil which is something which has always fascinated me since i was quite young i didn't really know the word for it you know the word which doctoring was because we're a colony three times right so the right words are kind of gone and placing the finding it even is difficult now it's practiced in the south of the country so i mean you know, I, one of my recent trips back home, my mom and my daughter were both with me and I found a book in a store called Thovil. And I picked it up and I was like, yes, I recognize this. I recognize the object hood of it and the, some of the uh, rituals of it and the ceremony of it. It was all done in these photographs by these German white people. And, uh, and that was this, you know, pretty good documentation of the whole practice in this little book in a design shop of all places. And um, took it home to the hotel room. And I showed my mom, I was like, look, Toville, you know, what do you know about Toville? She's like, that's not, that's for, she used the t phrase uneducated people, like sort of like people, who, rural populations. And there's a divide in Sri Lanka between sort of the cosmopolites and the rural person, right? Of like, and it's like, there's so many, there's so much class divide. There's so much racial divide and ethnic divide in Sri Lanka. It's almost like our branding is like, we divide ourselves from others. So, so, you know, it was really hard. You know, she was just like, yeah, we don't, uh, your dad might know a bit more. You know, he's traveled more throughout the country. Like, I don't really know. This is kind of like backwoods stuff. Like, I don't know about it. I was like, yeah, but I've seen these things around. There's like little parts and pieces of it that show up in, you know, I'm single So like s different ceremonies, like weddings and like, you know, certain types of things, pujas at the time, the Buddhist temple. So it's kind of like, oh, that's so weird. There's bits and parts of this around. And, uh, and I just started researching it more and more. Um, and then for this trip, I went to see a scholar named Gananath. Gananath is a scholar from like the 60s and 70s in Sri Lanka. By the time I visited him, he was very old, you know, so he couldn't remember. His wife was really, really helpful in like kind of giving these stories of the way he would go out and document the Akutovil. Uh, ritualistically in terms of its very ornate presentation, theatricality, so it's theater as well. Yakutovil presents theatrical ritualistic performances from six, I believe it's sunset till sunup. So all night long conjuring demons, dealing with them, exercising people, and all through this sort of like theatrical show that includes many characters and comedy and all sorts of really beautiful, cool, engaging stuff. So researching it, researching it, so it started, you know, showing up in my work. Um, the first one was uh, for the works for Jeffrey Deitch, L.A., um, an amazing show called Wonder Woman, curated by Kathy Wong. Um, and I did a set called Waiting for Sanyaka. And that's not in the power works, but, you know, very pivotal um, diptych where I start to feel really, really confident navigating this kind of spirit world and the feelings that I get from all this research and things I'm doing and feelings I get from going back home and kind of getting closer and closer to this, this uh, practice and this, this uh, way, of, way of 
living, which is old and it, which is sort of animistic in a way, like it's involved with the forest and it presupposes that there are beings in there, which of course there are, you know, and we don't know that anymore. We need to, I want to know that again. So the works from Vessel with Two Mouths are my attempt of knowing that again, you know, and, um, and just kind of like coming up with all sorts of like visual references, like looking through research, photographs, even sort of like drawings of it from like old Singhala Southern style uh, drawings and paintings. Um, and yeah, I really wish that it was more highly regarded and engaged with back home. But definitely, you know, we've got a puritanical sort of whitewash of, you know, ev single, sing a Buddhism as a religion in Sri Lanka is going uh, completely in the wrong direction. And it's like uh, being used as a tool for nationalism. So I, my feelings for Buddhism are also becoming very complicated and maybe not so great at this time. Um, but yeah, the vessel with two mouths kind of like deals with the works from that show deal and the series deal with these feelings and, and, uh, let me, um, get closer, be closer with them. Kuvani is an incredible character from Sri Lankan folklore. This is somebody I'm starting to really identify with. This is a bad woman. She is the daughter of the demon king Ravana, who seduces one of the first Indian kings who comes down into Sri Lanka to populate the island. And there's all this drama and like very strange things that happen. You know, she has children with them. And, you know, upon trying to leave, I believe that she's trying to leave a situation or to regain her agency inside a situation where when she's murdered by her family members and then the children are lost in the woods as well. So it's something I just kind of feel like in Sri Lanka, our particular brand of misogyny that's been there and continues in different sort of, it gets rebranded and it, you know, comes up under the guide, guise of Buddhism and Hinduism and Christianity, there's this kind of like practice of like undervaluing and hating on women or women identifying folks for sure. And um, Kevuni is like this woman that I just love because she tried to do, she tried to regain power in, a, in an ugly political situation. This is a mythical story. Um, she's kind of banished and murdered. And but, you know, the way that she seduced this king was that she showed up in his dream as a jaguar who sticks her tongue out at this king. And then for some reason, he knows this is Kuvani and he falls in love with her. So it's regarded as a curse, you know, falling, lo falling in love with somebody who's, first of all, outside your caste, might be outside of your species as she's the daughter of King Ravana or a relative of King Ravana, I believe she's the daughter. And, uh, and she's, she's, you know, and that's regarded as a, as a curse that he finds interest in someone outside of his caste, outside of his, you know, jurisdiction as a member of royalty. And the result of this interaction is her brutal murder, you know, and the, I don't know what the word is and kind of the, uh, how do you say when, you lose ownership of children, like they, they go into the, the either, right? Because they can't be possibly heirs, right? So, so I really love the story of Kuvani. I want to save her. I want to talk about her. Um, and I care for her. I care for that character and I care for, for what that represents, you know, whether it's back home or here too. We want to pretend like women don't go punished for, for doing what they want to do and living the way they want, but they do. Right. So so I just want to give that care and make work about her. So Kevani's curse is a Yakutobel practitioner standing on Kuvani's tongue in her mouth. So the mouth that you see in there is the mouth of Kuvani. As the jaguar in the dream. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit of a lighthearted treatment of like something that's a bit heavy, but I feel for Kuvani. I love her. Yeah, I think she's great. <laughs>
So, you know, I've been going back to Sri Lanka more and more often, as much as I can now. I'm very fortunate to, I mean, we go during low season, low travel season, because it's like very expensive to cross the world now. And we do it less. So about once a year now I'm going home. And then uh, staying for as long as I can. So this time I made friends with a very cool Italian man who bought a, a hotel at the top of a mountain. So my ancestors come from Candy where the mountains are. And he was like, do a, do you, would you ever do a residency? I was like, here, yes, of course, because it's a beautiful place. Um, it's called Ellerton Bungalow. And uh, he wanted to like open an art gallery and like do all these really cool things that are a little bit, you know, low key. It's not full on, I'm a gallerist, like I'm a dealer. Like there was nothing like that. He's like, let me just welcome you, bring your kiddo. And then thing, and I was like, okay, we're gonna do, let's do a residency and I'm gonna produce an exhibition for this space. And uh, I took Sayuri and we went. This is the time I meet Gananath the scholar, um, and uh, we went to a tea factory. We walked around in the mountains collecting red earth. So our soil, especially inside the mountains in Sri Lanka, is bright red. It's full of iron oxide. It's full of iron that's rusting and rusting and rusting forever. And um, you can pull it out. The clay content is so-so on it, but you can form things and dye things with it. Um, the, our red clay comes from, the, our red clay is the same stuff, but it forms a different look when it's in the ground. And then when you fire it, the red turns on. So we have terracotta, it's replete with terracotta. And I always grew up sort of like, you know, when we wind up through the mountains and we go from, when I, we used to go from Colombo into Candy, winding through the mountains to visit family and friends, whatever. Um, the streets are lined with these really beautiful terracotta shops of just like local artisans making very cool, beautiful shapes, like mostly turned, circular. For me, they're very sci-fi, like they're very sort of like some of them are becoming quite, um, how do you say, whimsical and in some cases impractical and stylistic. So, so I always saw, thought that they were great artists. Um, but yeah, that's the clay, terracotta clay, and the soil is kind of looking the same. So we went up into the mountains and we collected clay, which my daughter kind of like helped me sift and turn into paint, which I painted with, she did some painting with that soil uh, paint. And we made work on textile fabric that was made in Sri Lanka, raw cotton, sometimes dyed. Um, the, the clay, we had a different type of clay that kind of looks like the terracotta that we, you know, that, because we didn't have access to a kiln, so it was like an air dry clay that looked like that. We were working with the soil to paint, and then I had my own paints there as well. So for two weeks, we kind of had this little beautiful, um, like a pavilion facing out onto the cloud forest, because it's cloud forest there. And we just made work for about two weeks. Sayuri made more work than me. Um, I made less works. And we kind of like sewed and painted and made a body of work together. And we exhibited it there at Ellerton Bungalow. So that was really cool. She loved that experience. I liked it too, quite a bit. And I would do it again. Um, yeah. Uh, that's so. That's the that's the that's my journey with my daughter to Sri Lanka, um, to make some work together. You know, all you need is one person to just facilitate something, that's uh, that's really cool. You know, and kind of open their doors to you. So thanks, Luca. <laughs> that was really that was really awesome. But the works are still there. They're in Sri Lanka. They're at Ellerton Bungalow. Yeah, of course, I mean, it, in addressing, you know, in addressing that sort of idea, like idealism has to exist in some way in this reconnection because the political situation in Sri Lanka is so political, economic, socioeconomic situation is so dire 
that I need to go in there with this feeling which you're talking about, which is like, this is just about me and my child reconnecting with my ancestral territory. And I can't be, I mean, even so, like when I go home, I meet while I'm trying to focus, because it's hard now to focus because where news is here and bad news is here and you know, this catastrophe is there and you know, it's very hard to focus on, on growing yourself now more than like ever, I would say. So, so there, there is a bit of that that's needed when we go home to try to rebuild my connection with where I come from, which has been sort of like colonially and historically erased over time uh, for millions of us, it's like this. And, uh, but also just to, for my kiddo to see where half of her comes from, like that's really important, I think, um, for her to know this other place and the way it works. But not to say that we didn't come upon, you know, priests, Buddhist priests who were actively recolonizing or colonizing the north and like knocking down Hindu temples and putting up Buddhist temples like this place is zoned for construction. You know, we're ethnically, like actively ethnically cleansing Sri Lanka. And that's what's going on right now back home for sure. Like, I don't know what to do. It's a little bit weird to like from here helplessly watch it. But yeah, there were fully, you know, there are priests who come up and like, yeah, you know, I have a YouTube account. You should follow me. And they've got like $500, you know, sunglasses on. They're like superstar celebrities. And their brand is, I'm going to ethnically cleanse this place in the name of Buddhism as a religion, which is now used as, again, as I said, a tool for nationalism. So it's like, there's, it, we've got problems back home, but I don't want that to keep me from forming my relationship with the place that made me. You know, I'm not a Canadian person at all, right? So, so I've got to know then what, you know, then what exactly? And that's kind of, I guess, the way my brain works. I have like this inquiring mind and I want to know it intimately wh where I come from, like what made me, yeah.